All right, so in our second lecture of design of experiments, we have to dig a little bit deeper because when we're doing a lot of experiments, we have to account for the fact that if we do too many experiments, we could very well get a false positive result, and we do not want that. All right, so here's how it goes. Basically, if we're going to be running multiple experiments, we have to account for multiple testing. And that's going to be the focus of today's lecture. So in the last lecture, we ended with this idea that ANOVA is actually a linear model. But there's a problem. If we try to estimate all k plus 1 parameters, that is a global mean and k treatment effects, well, we can't do it like a linear model. Um, mathematically, it doesn't work because the matrix that we'd be trying to invert to get the least squares estimator is, uh, well, non-invertible. Uh, it's rank deficient. So we had this idea that I was ending on that in practice, we can't estimate a global mean and all of the K treatment means or treatment effects. Uh, and as a result, we need a linear contrast um, or a linear constraint, I should say, because contrast is a slightly different thing that we'll talk about. Um, well, I guess they're kind of interchangeable, but we'll talk about uh, different types of contrast as well. But we need some sort of linear constraint on our parameters. Um, so we're going to pick up there with an example, because I think that would better illustrate this. So what we're going to do is look at this output from an experiment I ran in my notes. And what do we have here? Well, what we have here is an ANOVA table that came from having k equal to four categories with a sample size of little n being 10 for each category. So the total sample size capital N is going to just be 4 times 10, which is 40. All right, we can still do arithmetic. Anyway, oh, and I guess I should say I generated this data with the epsilons being normal, standard normal, normal 0, 1. But in practice, we don't know this. In practice, this is unknown but we can of course estimate the variance from the data, right? So I created this and I should say that there for the four category means, um, which I referred to as A, B, C, and D. So what we end up with is we end up with, um, I think in this case, yes. So in this case, the, let's move this guy down further if I can. There we go. I kind of gave you the answer before I set up to explain the setup, right? So the setup here is that we have our global mean mu. That one I'm pretty sure should be zero in this case. Yeah. And then what we have is we have our tau A, which is going to be minus one. Our tau B, which is going to be minus point one so just a small shift below the average we have tau c which is a small positive shift above the average kind of an intense one there let's uh there that's a little bit better and we have tau d which is going to be our category d and that's going to have a treatment effect of plus one so here Category A is one unit below the mean, and category D is one unit above the mean. So these are kind of the most extreme cases with categories B and C would just be a little bit below and a little bit above the mean. Um, when we generate this data randomly um, in R, and then we plug it into the uh, ANOVA function to fit such a model, we get this table that's sort of floating around right here. So again, what we see from the last class is we have our degrees of freedom. So again, the in this case, the, the label 
call uh, the label row corresponds to the treatment and the residuals as well just the residuals from last time so the first thing to note is right the degrees of freedom is going to be k minus 1 and n minus k which in this case is going to be 3 and 36 so that follows with what we talked about in the last lecture um, we have our sum of squares, we have our mean square, um, and we have our f value. So this is the, the f value here is going to be the test statistic. And the p value is very small. So, or maybe I should write, therefore, significant. Therefore, reject the null hypothesis that tau 1 is equal to tau, or I should, sorry, A, tau A is equal to tau B is equal to tau C is equal to tau D. Right, we reject that. We don't know specifically yet which ones are different. Um, we just know that there seems to be significant differences among the categories. Um, and yeah, this example was set up to make it kind of quite obvious where the error variance I use, the epsilons have a variance of one, uh, which is small enough to make it so that we can very um, precisely identify significance here. <coughs> All right, see if my voice holds out since I actually just am filming this lecture after the previous one. So <laughs> we'll see how long I can talk without uh, losing my voice. Anyway, um, yeah, so then we have to talk about what happens when we actually want to estimate the individual terms in this model. So the idea is that um, in R, and I'll do some examples actually in our studio to show you how this works, but I'm just going to write it out for now uh, in my notebook here. In R, the AOV function fits an ANOVA model. Great. Um, Following up from that, the uh, summary function will um, give an ANOVA table. So you can plug in your, your fitted ANOVA model to the summary function and it spits out a table like the one here that I was uh, referring to. Um, but if you say, if you specify, so in R summary is a, I think they call it a generic function, which means that there's summaries for lots of different statistical models. If you specify it and you tell it with a dot LM, M, then what you're saying is you're saying take this fitted model and print out the linear model lm for linear model print out that output and what it'll do is it'll estimate all of the coefficients in that model but like i mentioned last time we can't estimate all of them so we actually lose one um, so the summary dot lm gives us i should say by default something that I'm going to copy over, which looks like if uh, Windows is happy to copy and paste and hopefully not mess up my recording, fingers crossed that everything goes well. Something that looks like this. So when we see this output, and this is me formatting it in LaTeX a little bit nicer than what you'd see in R, but this is more or less the table that you would see with some other information if you were to um, use the summary.lm function on this data for an ANOVA model. So the first thing to say is that notice only B, C, and D are here. 
Uh, so wait, what happened to A and what is intercept? Well, by default, by default, R assigns category A. It actually does this alphabetically. So if you say had the provinces of Canada, then Alberta would be the first category. And in this case, A being the first letter of the alphabet is the first category. Of course, if you can manually reassign that, but by default, it just takes whatever the first one is alphabetically. So in this case, it takes A, the first category alphabetically. Um, yeah, R assigns category A to be the intercept. So that's this first column here, this first row, sorry, here. Therefore, what we get is that tau, well, sorry, this value here. So the value it gives is something that looks like minus 0.8 six, seven, eight. So wh where does that come from? Notice that it's actually pretty close to minus one, which is what I set the category mean to be. And in fact, what this is, is this is just Y bar for category A and then dot saying that I'm taking the average of all 10 observations in category A. Um, now, if we look at these next three, what we're actually getting here is um, this is the difference between, um, we'll say, category A and categories B, C, and D. That is, what we get is we get something that looks like y bar b dot minus y bar a dot. So the second row in this ANOVA table is actually not the average for category b. What it is, is it's the average for category b minus the intercept, which is the, the average for category a. Um, thus, what we see here is something that looks like a value of about 1, 1 1.01, um, which is somewhat close to what we should see. The actual difference should be, I guess, 0 0.9, so it's not that far off. Um, and then similar for the rest of them. So the second or the third row would be yc dot minus y bar a dot. And the fourth row is going to be y bar d dot minus y bar a dot. So these are the four things that we're estimating from our data. We're estimating sort of the baseline category, which defaults to A, and then we're estimating the differences between category A and categories B, C, and D. Now, this makes a lot of sense if A was a control group or a placebo group, and we wanted to say, okay, the default for our, let's say, untreated um, subjects is A. And then every other group um, becomes uh, sort of, well, what happens when we apply B to this group? What happens if we apply C? What happens if we apply D? How much does it change from A? And that's where the, the, um, the p-values are telling us in the right-hand column. So it's always good to understand what is a p-value actually telling you, right? Because you look at this and you say, ah, R put a bunch of stars there. So it means it's significant and I guess we can go home. But if we don't know what we're testing, then we don't know what a significant result means. Uh, so we really, it's really important to know what's the hypothesis being tested by each p-value in the right-hand column. So uh, let's start at the top here. I'll say the p-value for intercept um, is basically saying, is testing the null hypothesis that the category A uh, is going to have sort of a zero treatment effect. 
versus cat, um, the alternative that category A is not zero. And then when we look at the following um, P values for the other three rows, we are testing um, for differences between category A and categories B, C, and D, respectively. So our null hypothesis is actually going to be that T A is equal to say T B, um, or tau, sorry, I should say tau because I'm using the Greek letter, um, versus the alternative, which is tau A is not the same as tau B. And similarly, for tau C and tau D. So this is what's being tested in the global sort of ANOVA table that we had up here. We're testing whether or not um, all of the towels are equal or if there's at least one that's not equal to another one, right? And that significant result at the top of the page here is telling us that yes, we believe that at least one category is different from another category, but we don't know which one. When we get down to here, um, we're testing now the differences between group A and groups B, C, and D. Now, quick side note, um, this is not adjusted for multiple testing, which is something we will consider in much more detail at a later lecture. I believe that's chapter three in my online lecture notes. Um, roughly what that means is that if we run multiple statistical tests, even if they're all independent of each other, we may just get lucky and get a significant result by dumb luck. The idea being that if I were to take, say, 10 coins from my in my pocket and throw them on the floor, the odds that they all land heads up is one in a thousand. So that's probably not going to happen. But if we all start throwing 10 coins on the floor, then there's a much higher chance that by dumb luck, we all we one of us will see all heads um, face up. So the idea is that when you're running multiple statistical tests, like in this case where we just did four statistical tests, we would need to consider multiple testing correction. Um, we're not going to get into that right now, um, but we will get into that. Well, we'll do a little basic version of that with the Tukey test at the end of this lecture, and then we'll talk about this more seriously um, later in the course. It's just something to be aware of. Um, but before we're done, we actually have to consider a different um, way of adding a linear constraint to our um, data. Because as I mentioned, uh, so what I said before was that our defaults to setting category A as the intercept or a baseline intercept with a C um, or baseline category. But if we use the function contra for contrast, I guess, dot sum, uh, we change this. So if I use this, I can use, there are various commands, contra dot something, um, and these will change the linear constraint or the contrast that we're applying to our parameters. So if I run the exact same data, right, the data has not changed. If I run the exact same ch data, but change the um, response, then what I get is a table that looks like that. Okay, so now everything's different, right? The intercept, all the estimates are different. 
uh, and the significance looks different because we're running different hypothesis tests here and we have to be aware of what we're running. So let's look at this in more detail. Um, so I'll say now the, I'm already writing intercept, <laughs> the intercept is uh, the global mean. the global mean y bar dot dot and rows um well i'll just say label one two and three that's just the default terminology in r label one two and three i will say correspond to uh treatment treatment A, B, and C, but D is gone. This is what I was trying to say at the end of the last lecture, that D is actually going to be the sum, the negative sum of A, B, and C. So you can kind of recover the estimate for D, um, but it doesn't appear in the ANOVA table because we can't test for all of these um, uniquely. So when you do this, the hypotheses change. Now, the first row tests the following hypotheses. It tests the null that the global mean, that is mu, is zero versus the alternative that mu is not zero. And what we see is a p-value of 0.52, so it's very much not significant, uh, meaning that we have no evidence to reject the null being the mean, the global mean being zero. Uh, and in fact, that's how I generated the data. I generated this data um, through simulation with the global mean being zero, so it aligns with what we would expect. We don't have a false positive here. Um, and I'll say rows two, three, and four test the hypothesis, the null hypothesis that um, what that uh, I guess tau a I was going to say different from zero, but no, it's different from the is uh, is equal to the. Yeah, see, it's a little bit subtle here. It's actually the treatment effect is zero, but what we're kind of saying here is we're actually saying that um, that the because the treatment effect would be the difference between yeah the mean and the category. Okay, so it's a little bit. It's technically what we're actually doing is here is we're saying mu plus tau a minus mu is equal to zero because what we're saying is category a is going to be the global mean plus the eighth treat the a treatment effect and we want to know if that differs from just the global mean with no treatment effect um, so it's effectively saying is the um, category a zero or not um, and then yeah, the alternative would be tau a is not zero. So what we find, um, what we find is this is um, significant. So we have very significant p-value for um, category a but not for b and c which are rows three and four respectively in that table because the means that i or the the treatment effects that i i chose for b and c are just very slightly different than zero whereas for a and d they're very different than zero up to the, the variance. Um, 
Now we can't test D here because of the way the contrast was set up. We sort of lose D in the table, but we can still estimate tau D. Uh, we just don't have the hypothesis test because of the way the mathematics works out. So this is quite subtle. Um, and it can be a little bit confusing at first, but it's really, really critical because when you're, you know, trying to analyze real data, write a report for a customer, for a supervisor or whatever, uh, you really need to know what the, what the table is telling you, what the hypothesis tests are and what they mean. Um, and depending on how your stats program are or otherwise reports the table and how it sets the contrast can mean different things. Um, that being said, there's actually a better way to do all the pairwise comparisons. That's going to be a post hoc Tukey test, which we'll talk about. But first, I do want to do one quick side note, um, which is going to be my side note, somewhat irrelevant to the discussion at hand, um, on sample size. So we have a quick side note, which is that often uh, we want to know what a good sample size would be. Size would be. Um, because if we're going to go out and actually start collecting data, that costs money, that takes time. Uh, if we can get away with a smaller sample size, then that means we can, well, save money, save time, and uh, use those research grant money or use whatever the corporate dollars for other endeavors and not have to put it towards data collection. Um, on the other hand, if we don't collect enough data, we may not have enough power to detect a significant result. And then, well, we might just end inconclusive with the inability to reject the null as we may have set out to do. So the problem is that we need to figure out a good balance here. And in R, um, there is a function called power dot ANOVA dot test. And this will compute a sample size. But based on a couple parameters, based on, on K, um, the number of groups, and the, well, what they call the between variance and the within variance. So they're between dot variance is going to be our um, treatment sum of squares, and their within dot variance is going to be our error sum of squares. And then the power, oh, and power, power, which is the probability to reject H naught, the null hypothesis. Now, the problem is in practice, we don't actually know what the, I mean, we know what K is because that's part of our experiment, but we don't know what the between or the within sum of squares, that is the treatment or the error sum of squares, we don't know what those are before collecting data. So typically we would need to say, use past studies, um, good guesses, or pilot studies to estimate these because we don't know what they are. Um, so these are different ways you could do it. I mean, if you have, you know, smart people in a research area who can just say, ah, I think the right sum of squares should be about this value, then okay, you can just go with that. Uh, on the other hand, it's typical to look at, say, past studies. If you're doing an agricultural study, well, other people have already done that. And it looks like my camera has decided that after 30 minutes, it's going to take a little break. What I was saying is that you can use um, past studies 
thing um, to help guide you as to what the sample size should be based on what those past studies found. You can also run your own pilot study. So a pilot study, which we'll talk about more later in the course, would be a small study that will allow us to get a sense of the landscape. What factors could be important? What are the variances, the sum of squares in play? And through that pilot study, we can get an idea of how to pinpoint a more proper and comprehensive targeted study. So these are things to just keep in mind when you're trying to design your own experiments. Meanwhile, um, let's get back to this whole discussion on contrast. So that was just um, a little side note uh, because it's quite useful to be aware of. But now we have to talk about the idea of multiple comparisons and the Tukey test. All right, so what are we trying to do here? Well, like we did in the uh, above, above what we saw was that I can test for the difference in the means for categories, say A and B, or A and C, or I could even do B and C, or C and D, right? Any two pairs, I can test the difference. And what I would do to test the difference would be to do a t-test. So just because, just because R will only give you um, four hypothesis tests doesn't mean we can't do more. It just means we have to be careful when we do more. So let's start at the beginning and try to write that down. Um, so the idea is um, if I want to test for the significant difference between, let's say, um, I think in my notes I used i and j, so we'll just say, is tau i, the ith category, the same as the jth category, or in the alternative setting, is the ith category different from the jth category, right? This would be a natural thing that we would want to test. Uh, well, what we can do is we can just write out a classic t-test. Um, then I can use a t-test. Great. And that's something that would have shown up in sort of stats 101 type courses. Um, but we'll write down the equation anyway. This is an unpaired t-test. Um, so what we have here is something that's going to look like the difference of the sample means. So we have the difference of the sample mean for category I and category J. And um, we have to normalize that by an estimate of the variance or the um, standard error. Uh, in this case, what we'll have is we'll have 1 over Ni plus 1 over Nj. This is assuming that categories I and J do not have the exact same sample size. If they do, then they both just become 1 over N. But I'm kind of writing this in a slightly more general setting, um, even though in the end we'll often just want to assume that all the sample sizes have, or all the categories have the same sample size for simplicity's sake. Um, in practice, that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but again, this is design of experiments, so hopefully we can design an experiment so that all the categories have the same sample size. Uh, we're not just collecting data sort of ad hoc. Anyway, the point is, is that on the numerator, I've got the difference of my sample means. In the denominator, I have my standard error, an estimate of the, well, I guess the standard deviation, the square root of the variance. And this will give me a t-statistic with n minus k degrees of freedom um, under, actually, I'll write it over here to make sure that I make this clear. This is under the null hypothesis. Again, it's always important to remember that when we're looking at a test statistic, we're writing down the distribution under the null so that our p-value will then give us evidence to reject the null and say, well, if this is what it should look like under the null, it doesn't look like that at all, so reject it and move back on, move on to the alternative hypothesis. So what we're saying is under the null that I category I and J are the same, at least have the same mean, um, 
then we would expect this statistic, this t statistic I wrote down, to have um, a t distribution. Again, assuming the errors have a normal distribution, which we're going to do for basically the entire course. Um, but then things become a little bit harder because if I'll say but with k categories we have k choose 2 which is k times k minus 1 divided by 2 different pairwise comparisons to test. And that could be a lot of tests, right? I mean, even with uh, k is equal to 10, we're up to what, 45 different hypothesis tests. And that could mean that the probability of getting a false positive uh, can actually be quite high. And that's where we have to consider the idea of uh, multiple testing correction. So the first is going to be the simple but, or maybe simple is the wrong word, the easy to apply the easy to apply but overly conservative approach, uh, which is the Bonferroni correction. On Ferroni with two R's. And what Bonferroni said was what we're going to do is instead of, of rejecting H naught if the P value is less than some alpha, say 0 0.05, 0 0.01, you know, whatever you want, your rejection threshold. Um, we divide alpha by the number of tests, um, which I write in my notes as k tilde, which is k tilde being this k choose 2, which is equal to the number of tests. Um, so this is a, and this doesn't just apply to this specific setting, the Bonferroni correction is really good to know because it applies to just about any multiple testing setting that you can imagine. Um, but as a result of the wide applicability, it's also overly conservative. So in this specific case, it's not exactly what we want to do, but it is good to write out all the math and show that it makes sense. So why does it make sense to take that significance level and divide by the number of tests performed? Well, that means that the probability that there is at least one i and j such that the t statistic comparing i and j is greater than the threshold. This is basically me writing reject null hypothesis in, I think I called this alpha prime, given the null hypothesis. So this is basically reject h naught given that h naught is actually true. So this is a false rejection. Um, so the probability of at least one false rejection, this is a family-wise control. Well, mathematically, we can write that out as the probability of the union over all i and j. So this is the union of all the events, which basically is a way of saying that, ah, we're rejecting at least one of our test statistics falsely. And again, we're going to talk a lot more about multiple testing corrections later in the course.
but it is good to just write it all out now, just so it all kind of makes sense. Um, now, the idea is that when we have the probability of a union, we can use, I guess it's Boole's inequality, if I recall correctly, off the top of my head, um, since I didn't actually write it in my lecture notes, but I'm pretty sure it's associated with Boole's inequality. And what we do is we replace the probability of a union by the sum of the probabilities. So what we show is that this is less than or equal to the sum over i and j of the sum of the probabilities that each that we reject each one. And this notation is just the fancy way of saying reject the null hypothesis that category i and category j have the same mean um, given that the null h0 is actually true. So when we do this, what we find is that we actually have, well, how many, how many terms are in this sum? So this sum is summing over k tilde hypothesis tests, and the probability of a false rejection is going to be alpha divided by k tilde. So when we multiply that together, we just get alpha. And what this basically means is that the probability of at least one false rejection is less than or equal to alpha. So what that means is that if we apply the Bonferroni correction, uh, we are able to uh, make sure that we don't get a lot of false positives when we're doing all of these multiple comparisons between the K groups. Now, again, as I mentioned, this is overly conservative in this specific, well, in many settings, but in this specific setting, we can go one step further and do something more sophisticated thanks to uh, John Tukey. I'm pretty sure his name was John. Definitely Tukey. And make sure to uh, not use um, autocorrect for spelling or you're going to end up with a turkey test, and that just looks silly in any report. So always remember Tukey test um, and don't use spell check or autocorrect. Anyway, the Tukey test is the um, better method, but only applies to this setting, to this specific setting of ANOVA. Luckily, that's more or less what we're doing in this whole course. So uh, the Tukey test is going to be a really useful one to know. Ah, T still going. All right. So what the Tukey test says is says that what we're really doing is we have a whole bunch of T statistics. And what we're going to do is determine the distribution of the maximum of a bunch of T statistics and then use that thing to control the um, for multiple testing. So, okay, what does that mean? Well, effectively, we're not going to actually worry about the form of the distribution because the form of the distribution is quite messy and doesn't really matter for what we're doing. Um, but the idea is that um, the the idea is that we will use the I guess studentized range distribution or the student yes yeah, studentized range distribution studentized because of the student t test which is thanks to William Seeley Gossett, who published the t-test anonymously under the name student, um, which I'm guessing by this point in your statistical career, you may have heard the story already, but just in case you haven't, uh, he was working at the Guinness Brewery, um, what, I guess over a hundred years ago now when he came up with the t-test, um, but they didn't want to associate it with the trade secrets from Guinness, so it was published anonymously. Um, 
And as a result, it is now the student's t-test, the studentized range distribution, et cetera. Um, but it all goes back to Guinness. So uh, thank you, Guinness, I guess, for pushing the frontiers of statistics. Regardless, uh, we're going to use something called the studentized range distribution. And the idea is that we, and which gives a new threshold for rejection. So there's two ways to think about hypothesis testing. We can compute a p-value and then reject if the p-value is small enough. But equivalently, we could just set a t-statistic value and say any t-value greater than that number would correspond to a rejection. What, the, what Tukey's test does is it takes the original t value and replaces it with a new value based on the studentized range distribution. So the specifics are not overly important, but um, more or less the idea is that, I'll say roughly, if the sample sizes are all the same, which just makes the math palatable, um, and actually works well in this case, um, then what we're going to do is we're going to consider the fact that the probability of at least one false rejection, which is again this crazy jargon that there exists an i and a j such that uh, my test statistic tij is greater than c under the null hypothesis, well, above, if you see at the top of the screen, I wrote that thing as a union. So it's sort of the saying that at least one of the statistics is rejected. But there's another equivalent way to write that, and that's in terms of a, let's keep that on the screen, that's in terms of a maximum. Um, so this is equivalent to the probability that we reject the maximum T statistic which is t, everything's an absolute value because t could be negative or t could be positive if we have deviations above uh, like right tail or left tail. So um, that's why there's absolute value signs everywhere. So in this case, what we're saying is that the probability of at least one false rejection is the same as the probability of rejecting the biggest statistic, t statistic we get out, the biggest difference. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if we're going to reject at least one, we're going to reject the biggest one first, and then we'll work our way down from there. Um, so the studentized range distribution is all concerned with um, basically the studentized range distribution here is going to tell us what c is. And luckily, this is computed by, well, a computer. So we don't actually have to uh, compute it by hand because the, the equations are just annoying and it's not really anything enlightening. But it is good to know what's happening when you run a post hoc Tukey test. Um, so what Tukey says, Tukey says, dot, 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 if category, or if the sample size is, if the sample sizes are all equal, then we um, get the, I guess a, um, I guess a, a family-wise error rate, I guess we get, we get a, well, we'll just say test size family-wise, test size of exactly alpha, which is what we want. We want the probability of at least one false positive to be exactly alpha. The Bonferroni is overly conservative, which means the actual test size might be smaller than alpha, 
meaning that we might get some false negatives if we use the Bonferroni method in this setting. So using Tukey's method, um, we get exactly what we want, but only if all the sample sizes are the same. Um, so this is not true if sample sizes uh, differ, but still better than Bonferroni. Bonferroni with, there we go. Um, yeah, so the idea is that it's still doing better than the Bonferroni method. Um, because Tukey's tests applies very specifically to this setting of multiple comparisons with these T statistics and different category means. Um, if we're in more complex settings, we can't use Tukey's test, we might have to rely on Bonferroni or one of the other methods that we'll talk about later in this course. But for now, we're going to use the Tukey method and the Tukey method um, in R we use the function Tukey with a capital T, H, S, D for, if I recall, honest significant differences. If I knock my um, pop filter here. And what it's going to do is it's going to construct simultaneous confidence intervals for the differences between each mean. And also, um, you get some p-values. So we can do that for this example data. And I did do that for this example data. So let's, uh, let me copy that over and we'll see what we got. Right, so let's go back to the example. This is that same example data that I was using above with k is equal to 4 and little n is equal to 10 and categories a b c and d now right, so we're doing this exact same data set um, after doing a post hoc tukey test applied to this data set what we get is a table that looks something like this um, so here we'll say that each row is a difference is the difference the difference between two category means b versus a c versus a all the way down to d versus c the first column here is going to talk is going to compute the this is the um, actual difference between the categories note that it can be positive or negative depending on if the first category is larger or smaller than the second the mean of the first category is larger or smaller than the mean of the second category um, and then the next two are going to give us confidence intervals that hold simultaneously. So this is important because when you compute a confidence interval in statistics, right, you're saying with some probability, say 95%, because that's usually the default for better or worse, um, what we're saying is with that probability, we expect the true population difference to lie within this confidence interval. Okay, but that only applies to a single one. And if you have two 95% confidence intervals, the probability that they jointly hold is not 95%. Um, I can do that off to the side. So, right, the probability, basically the idea is that if one interval holds with probability 95%, um, and the second one holds with probability 95%, well, the joint probability, right, the probability that two 
intervals hold is not going to be 95%. It should be, I guess, 95 squared, or it's 0.95 squared, uh, which is going to be less than 0.95. So the point is, is that you can't just take, just like you can't have multiple hypothesis tests and just treat them separately, you have to consider multiple testing corrections. If you have multiple confidence intervals, you have to widen them so that they hold jointly. And that's what the Tukey test does by default. So what we have in the Tukey test here is that we have confidence intervals. That means that with 95% probability, I say by default, and by default. So the idea is that with 95% probability, the differences in the parameters should lie within each of their respective intervals. And that should hold, I guess, again, with probability 95%. Um, by default, you can, of course, change this in the, in the settings in R. Um, so it is good to be aware of what it's actually telling you. It's actually a much better result than just giving you a bunch of ad hoc confidence intervals because all of these are holding at the same time. So what that means is that we think, okay, category A and B, well, the difference is probably somewhere between minus 0.08 and plus 2. So that's that pretty wide, but still, um, it's uh, it still is you know interesting enough. Now the p values, which we'll just shove in over here, the p values are adjusted for multiple testing. Right, these are the p values that are coming out of Tukey's test. Um, using the studentized range distribution. What that means is, therefore, reject any less than alpha for your choice of alpha. So for example, if we decided that alpha should be 0.5, we could, let's say, reject and definitely reject this one. But we don't have enough um, evidence, um, enough data, say, and enough evidence to reject some of the other ones at the 5% level. Um, so for example, we know that D and B should differ by about one unit. That's this um, second to last column here that I'm talking about. Um, we know from the, the setup that the difference should be about one. It actually should be 1.1. The um, estimated value here is 0.97, which is about right, but the variance, because we only have a small sample size of 40 in total data points, the variance is large enough that we can't claim that there's a significant difference between category D and category B. If we were to collect more data, that may allow us to detect such a significant difference. The only significant differences we see at the 5% level after adjusting for multiple testing are between C and D and between A and D. So all we can really conclude is that from the global test is there are differences and from Tukey's test that C and D look different and A and D look even more different. And of course, categories A and D were the ones with the most extreme difference between the two of them. All right, so that's actually a pretty good place to uh, stop right now. Um, so I'm going to take a little breather. We're going to reset the camera, and then we're going to jump into the idea of random effects, um, which is something we're not going to talk a lot about in this course, but it is still worthwhile to take, say, 20 to 30 minutes to um, do that. And we're back, and we're going to talk a little bit about random effects, which is section 1.3 in my lecture notes. Now, in that section, if you're actually reading along, you'll see that there's a lot of computations about trying to estimate the variance. I'm going to skip over some of that in this version of the course because I don't think that it's particularly enlightening. It's more so just um, pushing terms around for the sake of pushing terms around to estimate something. Um, instead, I just want to talk a little bit about 
what random effects are and how the hypothesis testing setting is going to differ from when we look at fixed effects. Um, and that'll wrap up the end of this uh, second lecture. So let's block this off and say random effects as one little bonus topic for lecture two. So as I mentioned, I think way back in the first lecture, that sometimes what we're doing is we're getting something called a random effect, which is a factor level that we really can't control. This might be like choosing a subject for our study, like, again, taking five rabbits out of a big box of rabbits. Uh, we just pick five at random, and those are going to be the rabbits for our study. Now, each of those is going to react a little bit differently to the treatments that we would give them. Um, and we want to understand that, but we also want to, we, we don't really particularly care about the different levels, right? So let me, um, let me write that down to be a little bit more precise. So the idea is that for, say, treatment groups A, B, C, and D, we want to know how the response, the response variable, differs between them, between each pair. This is what we just talked about in the post hoc Tukey test, right? We might be interested as, okay, is there a significant difference in my factors? Okay, yes, there is. I did my global hypothesis test, my F test, and I found out that there's a significant difference. And then we follow up and say, well, I want to estimate the treatment effect for each of my categories. And I want to know, is there a significant difference? Does, say, medicine A perform better than medicine B? Or are they about the same? Does it do worse? These are questions that I might be interested in. I said, but for a random effect, I don't care about this. about this. And this is one of the ways I think about random effects, right? If you were to select five rabbits from the population of rabbits to then run your experiment on, I don't really care if rabbit A is performing better with respect to res um, the response variable than rabbit B, um, or maybe they're the same, maybe they're different. It doesn't really matter too much to me. Um, the point is that we want to take that variability and the fact that each of the rabbits will behave slightly differently when subjected to treatments um, and control for that. Uh, so what that means is that we have the same, they have the same model as before, um, but the hypothesis that we're testing is going to be a little bit different. So I'll say as before, we have a model that looks like um, y i j is going to be mu plus tau i plus epsilon i j. Okay, so that didn't change, but instead of treating tau i as fixed, we treat it as being normal, having a normal distribution with some mean, mean zero and variance nu squared, where we use the Greek letter nu so that we don't conflict with the sigma squared, that's the variance of epsilon, All right? So therefore, we don't estimate tau i hat, but instead estimate nu 
hat squared. So what that means is that again, like the rabbits, I don't particularly care how each of them perform in the test. What I care about is the variance in the population of rabbits. So if I'm going to be applying my medication to a bunch of rabbits, I might want to know, well, what's the variance that we might expect coming out of that population of rabbits? Um, and that's going to be this new squared term. So then the hypothesis test becomes a little bit different than before. Now what we're going to see is we're going to have the hypothesis test is going to be that new squared is going to be zero versus the alternative new squared is greater than zero. So this is the null setting, which is telling us um, basically no random effect. And this is basically some random effect. So that's what we'd be testing for if we had a random effect. We might want to test for basically is it it's it's very similar to the um the one we did before. Before we said, well, is at least does one of is at least one of the treatments significant, significantly different than the others. In this case, we're just saying do we think that the variance of my random effect is non-zero or just zero? Um, so how do we do that? Well, we do that with an f-test. We do that exactly as before. Um, sort of luckily, we can do this as before with the exact same f test and statistic um, which just for the sake of writing it down one more time is the ratio of the treatment sum of squares with its degrees of freedom k minus one and the air sum of squares with its degrees of freedom n minus k um, again which is going to have an f distribution with the same degrees of freedom k minus one and n minus k um, under the null hypothesis um, so once again we can actually just use the exact same method um, to um, the same F test to determine whether or not the variance is um, uh, zero or whether it is non-zero. Now, what I will say, and again, I don't plan on actually um, testing you on this, but I think that it's worth to just write it down. Um, and if you want more details, they're in my notes. Um, so I'll say in my notes, you can find a derivation for the estimator new hat squared. Um, and it really just comes down to figuring out what's the expected value of the treatment sum of squares and what's the expected value of the error sum of squares. The answer um, is going to be something that looks like 1 over n minus or times the difference in the treatment sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom minus the error sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. So it's going to look something like that. Uh, again, I'm not too worried about being able to reproduce the derivation, but perhaps in the office hours we can discuss that in more detail if you're interested. Um, now, in this case, one thing to note, because if you actually try to estimate this variance in practice, I want to say note, it could be negative. Um, but 
the actual variance, um, I guess, has to be greater than or equal to zero. You can't have a negative variance. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, the idea is, is that, well, okay, when you estimate it, it could be negative, but if it's negative, we can just replace it with zero because it um, would indicate that it, there definitely is, is no evidence that there's a random effect present in our data. And uh, let's write furthermore, furthermore we can derive a confidence interval for the global mean because recall that um, our model is just going to be yij is the global mean plus tau i plus epsilon ij. So if we want to compute a confidence interval for the global mean mu, we have to take into account the random effect and we have to take into account the um, I guess the random noise. And remember this is variance nu squared and this is variance sigma squared. So if we were to actually want to compute a confidence interval for the global mean, this would be like the average rabbit response. Um, if we're going back to my hypothetical example about dosing a bunch of rabbits with medication, um, then that's, uh, there'd be two sources of randomness that we'd have to consider. Um, again, if you want to see the detailed derivation, you can compute uh, the variance is computed in my online lecture notes. It's also in a lot of textbooks. Um, but just to write it down for the sake of exposition, uh, I'm just going to skip to the answer again because I think it's good to write it down just to show you what we would get after the what a confidence interval would look like. So the confidence interval says that, well, um, this is a one minus alpha confidence interval. Um, and what we get is that the difference between the true mean, mu, and the estimated mean, mu hat, uh, should be, well, bounded above by some t statistic with k minus one degrees of freedom and, well, alpha over two. And the standard error bit, which comes out of the equations, is going to look like the treatment sum of squares divided by um, some crazy thing, which is going to be n times k times k minus 1. Okay, so again, I'm not going to go through the derivation of that, uh, but the point being that if the treatment sum of squares, that is the sum of squares associated with tau, if that gets, um, the bigger that gets, the wider my confidence interval gets. The smaller that gets, then the smaller it gets. So um, the confidence interval in this random effects testing setting is specifically dependent on the treatment sum of squares. So that's going to tell us kind of how wide or how narrow our confidence interval will be. Um, and I have one example here, which I can copy over from my notes to illustrate the idea. Um, and then we will end this lecture for, I guess, today, for whatever the definition of today is in the um, time of COVID. So here I have an example. This is an example using the LME4 package. I should say packages function LMER, which linear mixed effects 
uh, linear model. I forget what LMER is supposed to stand for. I think it's a linear mixed effects model. Um, because when you have random and fixed effects, it becomes a uh, mixed effects model. Um, but I, uh, yeah, don't know exactly. I'm trying to remember exactly what that stands for. Regardless, um, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that this is the same data, the same, I'll say, fake data as before with k being four categories, n being ten observations, and categories a, b, c, and d. So before when we looked at this I was treating it as a um, fixed effects. But let's just say that, because this is all hypothetical made up data anyway, let's just say that they're going to be treated as random effects. So what happens? Well, what happens is that um, now when we run this through the LMER function, we get our intercept and our residual variances out, um, and we only get a fixed effect for the intercept. So this is the, this guy here is basically the global mean. Um, which is the same global mean that we would have seen up above um, in the other version. But now what we get is we get an estimate of the variance for our um, labels. So global mean and if I can get this well, up in here, what we'll end up with is an, um, an estimate for, um, well, nu squared and I guess sigma squared here, being the label category of 0.58 for nu squared and the residual um, 0.83 for sigma squared. So that's what this is doing. It's really just going to say, well, again, I don't care about the factor levels in this setup. So I'm just going to estimate the variance of my random effect. Um, and you can also give a standard deviation so that you get to see it without having to compute it yourself, I guess. Um, and it still will estimate any fixed effects that are in your model, because often in statistical practice we wouldn't just have a random effect on its own, we would have random effects and fixed effects, and we want to estimate the variances of the random effects and account for that variation in the data and those degrees of freedom, and then we go down to the fixed effects and we want to estimate the actual um, parameter parameters in the fixed effects uh, and then be able to test them. So in this course we're going to more or less ignore random effects because everything we're going to be looking at can be treated as a fixed effect, um, but it is good to be aware that these terms exist um, going forward. Right, so with that we have more or less wrapped up what I wanted to talk about in this section uh, we're going to stop for now, and then in the next class we're going to talk about the uh, best mathematical part of this course, the fabled Cochrane's theorem, which is a uh, great result. It's basically the theorem that allows us to do everything we're going to do in this course. Um, so thank you, William Cochrane, for uh, giving us that, because otherwise none of this would make any sense. Um, it is the most mathematical part of the course, so I hope that you stick around for it and then stick around after it when we talk about a lot more experimental designs. But I feel like it would be uh, unfair to do such a course and not prove Cochrane's theorem to everyone. Um, so we'll be doing that next, uh, once my voice has a chance to rest and I refill my uh, cup of jasmine tea here. With that, see you in the next lecture.